On this episode of the Seeking Eye Life Exploration podcast, our discussion mainly focuses around a document called the Galileo Commission Report, Beyond a Materialist Worldview Towards an Expanded Science, authored by Dr. Harold Vallach on behalf of the Scientific and Medical Network. This is certainly a very important report which looks very extensively at the current position of mainstream materialistic science, the background assumptions it makes and the limitations it faces, and gives a very compelling argument as to why and how a new form of science must begin to be established. If you'd like to have a look at this report yourself, details are available at galileocommission.org. From here you can either download for free or purchase a paper copy of the full report or a summary report. However, do be aware that the full report, which is the version I purchased, is written with very technical language, so it may be very difficult to understand for the lay reader. However, as science has progressed, more and more anomalies have been faced, which a general materialistic paradigm doesn't seem to be able to effectively explain. So by all means, reports such as this must be made available and must be made public in order to establish a new science which can take these anomalous experiences into consideration. I highly recommend that anyone listening who is interested in this subject do have a look at this report to help make it more accessible to the general scientific community. Thank you for listening to this short introduction. Please enjoy my discussion with David Lorimer. I I wrote my first book um, in mainly in the summer of 1982. It came out in 1984, and it was called Survival Question um, Mark. And so I was I was looking at this sort of evidence um, you know, quite an early stage. And you no, know, so that and I just had the it was reissued um, under a slightly different title, Death as Transition, in 2017. So you're right. There is a there's a great deal of evidence um, if one wants to look for it. Hmm. Um, the one I recently <coughs> got my hands on, which was a recommendation from Jan Holden, who I spoke with recently, oh, yes. was the um, Galileo report. Oh, yes. Good. And I'll, I'll start yeah. working my way through that. Now, not being trained in science in any way or philosophy, some of the language in there is quite difficult to grasp, but generally I can get the general outlook of it, and it is very interesting. I'm up to the um, uh, which chapter have you, was have it? you got the summary version or the full version? The full, full version. Oh, the full version. Well, that's all the technical detail, yes, that's right. That's yeah, the summary as well. And the summary is not, in fact, contained in the main version, and so they're two different documents in that sense. Mm. Although the summary of the argument you'll find in both versions. Uh, yes. So there's really three iterations of it. There's the two page summary of the argument, then there's the summary, and then there's the full report. And you're right, the full report is meant to be quite technical and rigorous and, and fully referenced. Uh, and we are in fact, I've got, got a colleague at the moment who is doing a layman's version. And, and so he's, he's looking at uh, how to um, put it into plain language that um, less uh, sophisticated technical people can understand, um, which still makes the important points, um, which starts from the, the proposition that, that, the, that the, the idea that the brain produces consciousness is in fact a philosophical assumption rather than a scientific finding. And that's a crucial point to understand. Hmm. It's mainly um, comparing, as Harold Vallot mentioned, science one and science two, isn't it? Which is... yes, that's right. Yes, that's his own. That's his own formulation. And and, and what we're, what we're trying to do is to expand uh, science beyond its current philosophical limitations. And there are all sorts of historical reasons for why um, <clears throat> science has finished up with a materialistic outlook, or currently has a materialistic outlook. And a lot of those are to do with the historical relationship between science and religion. Yes, yes. When the scientific revolution took over, all these all these religious beliefs were kind of seen as supernatural, kind of, um, superstitious, 
and they were rejected outright, weren't they, initially? Exactly. Which is why I suppose this whole whole idea of logic and reason trumps everything else took over. Well, the thing is, that you <clears throat> you you have to logic and reason is not exclusive to science. And um, logic and reason is a neutral tool which can be applied to evidence and, and research and interpretation. And some, sometimes um, scientists with a materialistic outlook assume they have a monopoly of logic and reason, which isn't the case at all. Logic and reason, I mean, what, 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 we're, what we're looking at in the Galileo report is, uh, is what I would call evidence-based spirituality. And so there is an evidence base there. Um, and that's why we're inviting scientists to look through the telescope, not just scientists, but also philosophers and psychologists. And so we're using this metaphor from Galileo of the various people who thought they knew what reality was already. So they had no need to look through the telescope. And so these people, the modern, uh, modern scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists and philosophers, they think they know that the brain produces consciousness. So there's no need to look at any evidence to the contrary. Hmm. And that isn't That's scientific. Right. It's not scientific, nor is it philosophically rigorous. No, I mean, the evidence that's usually taken as emergence, which is something I always found interesting, is that the same evidence can be used for a different philosophy, such as the brain as a receiver and, trans and transmitter of consciousness. Yes, exactly. But, you know, you damage the brain and consciousness is impaired. We know that. And anyone will tell you that if they've ever been knocked out or, you know, your, your brain goes incredibly fuzzy if you get hit pretty hard on the head. We know that. <clears throat> And that's evidence that the brain does produce consciousness, of course. But it's also uh, also evidence that the brain transmits consciousness as a radio would. If you hit a radio very hard with a hammer, the sound you're going to get is going to be also distorted. Exactly. And... Exactly. And that, um, Steve Taylor at a, a conference, our Beyond the Brain conference, and last November, he said that whenever I have a good idea, I find that William James had it already. Uh, and the origin of this idea is actually not just William James, it's William James, um, but there was a person writing before William James called um, F.C.S. Schiller. And he was an Oxford Don um, who wrote a book called, um, it, and it came out in 1891, called Riddles of the Sphinx. And he, and he didn't actually publish it under his own name because presumably at that stage, the Oxford was already quite a skeptical place. Uh, and he published it under the name of a troglodyte. And a troglodyte means a cave dweller. And cave dweller is referring to Plato's cave and people inside the cave who thought they knew what reality was, but actually you need to go outside the cave to see the light, to know what um, the deeper reality is. Yes. And I mean, with, with my kind of depression and everything else, which was the, the cause of my research and this sort of thing, I often get bombarded with um, the old confirmation bias when looking at evidence. Yes. And, uh, you, 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 see, you get the evidence and, of course, you make it fit to your conclusion that you already have. And I get bombarded a lot with that. When you say bombarded, you mean people accuse you of having confirmation bias? Yeah, because of the depression. And I'm looking for ah. that. Okay. That conclusion. Yeah. Well, that's not, that's, I mean, everybody is inclined to confirmation bias. Um, in other words, um, that they, they come at evidence with a, a, a view they've already formed and they're going to tend to interpret that evidence in the light of that view. Hmm. And, and so it's not something that your opponents have and you don't have. Everybody no. has it. And it's, that seems to be something that's missed, isn't it? I mean, especially with the sceptical movement. They seem to, as you say, have the monopoly or they think they have the monopoly on logic and reason for their materialistic outlook. And yet exactly. kind of s s tend exactly. to... Exactly. This is really one of the things we're up against um, because they control all the Wikipedia pages on parapsychology and complementary medicine. And they patrol it like a kind of terrorist organisation. That if, if anybody tries to change anything, then they get threatened with being removed from for life from Wikipedia. Mm. I mean, I think there's a very distinct difference between that kind of scepticism and proper scepticism, which is very, very important, I think, in, in the scientific community. But I think there's a distinction between the general 
um, helpful scepticism and kind of the media scepticism and professional sceptics whose livelihood depends on them being correct. Well, the, 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 the usual distinction is between open-minded sceptics and pseudo-sceptics. And, and what, the, what you're talking about is pseudo-sceptics who've already arrived at a, at a dogmatic view um, and are not going to be persuaded by any, any, other, any evidence at all, even if they say they are. A sceptic should be open to changing his or her mind. And these pseudo-sceptics are not open to changing their mind. Mm. And I suppose in some sense you can be, you can understand why, because at the end of the day, you know, this is these people's careers and they have to keep keep face with their community. But at the same time, it doesn't really help proper science. No, well, I think it's also to do with peer pressure in the academic and scientific community. And so that it, because the background assumptions are materialistic, um, then if you stray out of that, um, then you, 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 come in for criticism and you may you know forfeit promotion and and grant opportunities yes we can see that with um cases like dr eben alexander with his near-death experience and the backlash he faced as a neurosurgeon yes indeed it's it's a it's a good it's a good case and i know eben you know quite well he he spoke at mystics and sorry beyond the brain in in 2018 mm. Um, what was the article that we've written about him accusing of malpractice and, and things like that to try and discredit his credentials? Uh, I can't remember, but it was based on misinformation uh, and there was a response to it. There was a, uh, there was a magazine article and, and there was a response to it from the International Association for Near-Death Studies. But it, the thing is that if you put your head above the parapet like Rupert Sheldrake, um, then people are going to attack you and, and they attack the people who put you on to speak or who publish you as well. They yes. Act the gatekeepers. Yes. And Rupert is a very well educated man. I know I, I tried to get in contact with him to to have a discussion with me, which he had to reject for time or Yes, exactly. He was just he was incredibly busy. But you can tell just by lis listening to him that he knows indeed what he's talking about and he's very well educated and yet because he comes with these different ideas that kind of supersede the current model he's seen as a heretic and, and a lunatic. Well, certainly a heretic. I don't think he's seen as a lunatic. Um, the, and the, the, of course, the, the whole category of heretic and, or heresy um, is carried over from religion anyway. And there shouldn't be such a thing as orthodoxy in science um, or heresy. There should be different views, but some of them shouldn't, uh, don't qualify as, as a kind of ex cathedra dogmatic statement. And although, you know, some ideas are treated in this way. Yes. But the whole idea of science is based on these unorthodox ideas being put forward, surely. Well, you need, yes, you need new ideas, but it depends on um, what framework they're put forward within. Um, because the, the science, um, the, 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 what, what um, Thomas Kuhn um, calls normal science is science done within a particular paradigm and then if you uh, ha have a finding that that um, transcends that paradigm or indicates it's incomplete um, then then you're doing what he calls revolutionary science and, and that's where the cutting edge is um, the revolutionary science but uh, what we're saying in the Galileo report then um, is that you need to look at your assumptions um, as well as your research program. Hmm. And the current science one, as Vala names it, is of course peppered with these assumptions that seem to be ignored or taken as as fact as, a, as opposed to assumptions. Well, they're taken as propositions. They're they're, they're regarded as as facts. Um, as factual findings when they're in fact assumptions. And, and it, it's inescapable, as we point out in the Galileo report, to make assumptions. You can't not make assumptions. Um, it's just impossible. And you, it's less in the same way as you need to, re, you need to use language in order, your own language, in order to describe things and articulate them. And, and that language shapes the way you think, and the way you think shapes the language. Mm. That's right, but it's <clears throat> being able to recognise assumptions as fallible as they are assumptions and that they 
must be revised if new evidence comes out to nullify them. Well, that's the point. And, and, and this is where the, the resistance arises. And you no, know, because most people are not aware um, that they have any assumptions. They just assume that this is how things are. Um, and so they don't make any distinction between philosophy, um, which gives you the basis of, of logic and reasoning, um, and science, which is empirical um, in terms of conducting research and experiments. Mm. Mm. Okay, so let's go on to the actual evidence of, of kind of a non-local mind survival of consciousness and um, kind of the evidence that counters <clears throat> the mainstream materialistic belief because the main one that I focus on, or I wasn't supposed to focus on, it wasn't my initial plan, but so many people are in this kind of field more than any others is the near-death experience. Yes. Which kind of is the holy grail of this separate um, mind and matter paradigm um, because obviously during cardiac arrest when the brain isn't functioning to the level which consciousness um, should be available, consciousness is still available at that, at that moment, if that makes sense. So surely that is that seems to counteract everything because that shouldn't happen. Yes, well, let, let me put that a bit, bit in context because in my book, Survival, um, I look at four areas. Um, the first is out-of-body experiences, you know, apart from near-death situations. Uh, the second are apparitions, uh, and occasionally you get cases which are called reciprocal cases, where an apparition corresponds to an out-of-body experience. So somebody having an out-of-body experience is seen as an apparition by the person they, seem, they, they think they are appearing to. And so these two... When this happens, then you've got a, a reciprocity which reinforces itself and makes the whole story more, um, more, more rigorous. And then the, then the third area is, is near-death experiences, which we'll come back to in a moment. And then the fourth area is survival of consciousness. And related to that are, um, is the whole question of reincarnation and uh, particularly the research showing that the children can remember previous lives. So that's a, that's a whole separate area, if you like. Now, what, what I did um, is I, I collected um, cases in all these four categories. Um, and so I have a kind of case um, index in survival. And one of the things that's interesting and is, is if you look at the descriptions of people who've died saying what it's like to die then they're identical to people in near-death experiences who seem to be going through the first stages of physical and brain death so in other words they're consistent they're what you call which is what we call phenomenologically consistent in other words the way they describe uh, what's happening to them they're leaving the body floating out of the body floating up the ceiling going into the light um, having life review. And these are exactly the things that are described in both cases, in near-death experiences and um, in post-mortem. So if one comes back to um, the kind of um, cases that you were referring to, the, the cardiac arrest cases, um, these go back to a study pub published in The Lancet by Dr. Pim van Lommel, who's a Dutch cardiologist. Um, which was a prospective study, about 350, just under 350 cases um, in different hospitals, where they interviewed everybody and found that about 18% of them had, had a near-death experience. Now, the most interesting part of this, or part of the near-death experience from the point of view of evidence, um, are the veridical um, out-of-body um, experiences, where um, what is seen by the um, experience uh, corresponds to what is later reported and corroborated and verified by somebody who was actually at the scene, but who was, who was, who was physically embodied, as it were. And there's a book that I've just actually been looking at this afternoon. I'll just get it. Um, it's uh, this one here. Yes, I've been. I'm in the process of reading that one as well. Yes, yeah, self, uh, yeah. self does not die, which is a um, <clears throat> hundred. Um, 
you know, investigated cases uh, of this phenomenon. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, these are, these are well attested. Uh, and so the, the way that I approach them is actually to, to con consider them, they are, they are case histories, what we call case histories in psychological research. And so they're not repeatable experiments um, no, it, as in science, but they're, they're, they're unique events that have happened to people. And so I, I set up a kind of thought experiment where I, I look at the, the legal definition and the legal, legal, legally rigorous way of assessing evidence. Uh, and that, that is that you have to try and establish what happened, what was the case um, beyond reasonable doubt. And so supposing you, you, you ask the, the two people, the experiencer um, and the person um, on, you know, who's let's say in the operating theater to describe um, the sequence of events, um, then you would be hard put to it um, to deny that the same sequence of events was being talked about by the experiencer and by the witness. And, and if that's the case, um, then you've got, us, you've got a, a case beyond reasonable doubt. They're talking about the same thing and therefore um, that the experiencer had true to life perceptions of events that were going on in the physical world. Now this raises an interesting question um, and one that, I, that it's difficult to answer and that is what space is the experience going on in? Um, because it can't be technically in identical to physical space because the, the space of, of physical perception um, is not the same as the space in these experiences or for instance, although it isn't the case that it's, it's like this in a dream. So that we, we're, we're familiar, we have a sense of space in a dream um, which we recognize as the same sense of space that we have when we're physically awake. And so these questions of, of parallel spaces um, are very interesting and they are gone into in a little bit of detail by a man called Michael Whiteman. Um, and Whiteman was both a musician, a physicist, and he had hundreds of out-of-body experiences and wrote about them in a series of books. And he lived till, until he was just over a hundred. Michael Whiteman. I Michael Whiteman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's another one to look up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is interesting, especially the out-of-body experience, um, when you separate that from the near-death experience. I know I've read books by Robert Monroe. Yes, I've read... There are three books by Robert Monroe, which I read a long time ago. Yes. Um, the Journeys, isn't it, a series of far journeys, journeys yeah. of the body, and... I forget the last one. I've got all three, but I haven't managed to work my yeah. way through them yet. Yes. And he approached this kind of thing. I mean, I spoke with Graham Nichols, who's also an out-of-body experiencer. Um, and he, very much like Robert Monroe, they're both very scientific, the way they approach and the way they reason their experiences. I know Robert Monroe performed um, experiments, didn't he, with himself as the main... Yes, he does. Subject. I can't remember much about them, but you're right. Yes, it was been a while since I read them as well. But I think these these things are very difficult to to um, to verify. For example, Sam Parnia and his Aware study. Yes, I um, know Sam. Yes, with, with his um, setting up targets for those out of body to view and verify later on. Um. Unfortunately, no such vision has taken place as of yet. So I don't know. What's your take on on that kind of? Result? Yeah, um, I I don't. I think this is this is um, elusive, um, because you know there's a certain logic in in the way that the experiment is designed, um, and um, but but it is. You're right. It's not the kind of thing that you would be preoccupied with because you you don't know. Um, if you if you suddenly find yourself out of the body, you don't know that you're part of a trial, um, and that the doctor's trying is hoping that you're going to see a series of numbers. Um, and indeed, 
um, some people would say that the seeing numbers um, makes it much, much more difficult um, than seeing some sort of bright object or something that was placed in an invisible place, but where, which, which one would have a kind of emotional reaction to, not just a kind of left hemisphere analytical appreciation and, and trying to have notice a number. I'm not sure whether um, having numbers is, is, uh, is a good experimental design in that respect. Mm. Wasn't Sampania's targets, as you say, brightly coloured? Um, could it be? I can't remember the detail. I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe he's, he thought of that um, and it, it still hasn't worked. Uh, so I think the, the obviously from a scientific point of view, so repeatable scientific trial point of view, it would be good if we were to get some, some positive results um, from this. Uh, but I, I think that one needs to deal separately with the enormous amount of evidence for veridical out-of-body experiences. And not just that, um, the evidence for, um, for survival. And, and what, we, what we've just done, um, uh, and I'm actually going to Geneva this weekend for a team meeting, is we've just published um, some analysis of just over 1,000 cases of after-death communication. And, and these are in French, English and Spanish. And so we've got a kind of cross-cultural sample. And the, the, the people were, were invited to fill a questionnaire in. There's 194 questions. And so it takes two or three hours to do. And only 4% of people um, failed to finish it, um, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and so we've got some very interesting data, there's 2 million words. Um, so there's, there's only, there's, we're just scratching the surface at the moment in terms of what we've looked at. And the, the main thing we've looked at are what's called crisis apparitions. Uh, and this is where someone appears to a, a, a loved one at the time of their death, as if to say goodbye, when the loved one concerned doesn't know that that person has died and only finds out later. And um, usually it's around the same time um, that the apparition was seen. Now, those, those sort of reports go back to the 19th century. And there, there, were, there were quite a lot of them reported in a huge two volume work called Phantasms of the Living, which came out in 1886. So it's not a rare occurrence. No, it happens often. No, um, but it's not one that is, is really understood and recognized by, um, by our contemporary culture. No, as soon as you mention anything like apparitions anywhere, it seems you get immediately jumped upon and told, well, you're grieving, you're expecting to see these things, <clears throat> you know, your mind's playing tricks on you. The, the, the standard, the standard kind of um, responses. Yes, I, th I think the other thing is I always use, um, I always use the term apparition um, and I never use the term ghost. Um, and you know, we did a survey about three or four years ago um, where we were very careful about um, you know, the questions we asked. And so we didn't ask, do you believe in ghosts, question mark, which is sort of a facile question. We asked rather, uh, do you think there's, there's good evidence for apparitions? And of course, the, the thing is that if you haven't read any good evidence, you're probably going to say no, even if there is. So it was a little bit tricky to interpret those results because we, we had different people um, responding, you know, some of whom were Christian believers, some of whom were spiritual, were not religious, some of whom were agnostics, and some of whom were atheists. And of course, the atheists gave the lowest score um, to did they think it was good evidence for apparitions or life after death, conscience after death. But then they would, you know, you would yes, expect that. Yes, of course. Yes, and these these kind of people are are the lay people who haven't really dug into the different types of evidence out there. I mean, as, as you say, which is right, the whole thing with Sampania's um, experiments, which seem to be the holy grail in the scientific community of 
of evidence to support survival and since there's been no um, perception of the targets that's kind of seen as evidence against it but that's not taking into account all the other areas of no. evidence you say yeah, Jim, Tuck right. <laughs> Jim Tucker and Ian Stevenson's work Robert Monroe's work um, and, and Titus Rivers, Rivers and all the others well, that's a different. Collectively. That's that. That's a different form of evidence, and, and so that's case history evidence as opposed to experimental evidence, and 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 you're right. You have to take the whole thing together, and and because it's a kind of converging case um, that you could make, um, and I think it's very difficult to you know dismiss the work of um, of Ian Stevenson as as not rigorous and not properly carried out. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole related areas of, you know, parapsychology, um, all, all of which suggests um, that there's more to the mind than the brain. Yes, someone I've been interested in looking at the work of is Dean Radin. I've only very much scratched the surface of it, but that yeah. seems very interesting. And, and there is in the Galileo Commission report a, a summary of of um, various parapsychological experiment That's results right. yes no dean dean radin um is go, goes back a long way and in fact i was just looking at his book this, this afternoon his most recent one called um, real magic and and uh, he's written four but four main books as well as numerous papers and journal articles and so um yes i mean he's a very interesting very interesting thinker hmm he is, and you look at some of the experiments that he's done and the way he's done them, and it's beggars belief how people can still say that it's, and I hate the word woo. Yes, well, that's really, the word woo is entirely rhetorical. It really has no content at all. Um, it's just um, a way of dismissing, um, peremptorily and derogatorily dismissing something you don't agree with. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a very unfortunate term but it is used um as a way of almost sort of suppressing and bypassing evidence mm. and it's mainly focused on researchers like deepak chopra who has a very kind of negative opinion from the scientific community yes but he's you know uh, but there's there's one there's a book that i was looking at again this afternoon uh, called war of world views and this is really what it is. It's a war of worldviews. This, and 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 so the 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 word using the word "woo" is a weapon um, in the war. That's really what. Yes. It is. So, with these meta-analyses of, of studies done, many would come back to the old argument of that it's um, based on anecdotal data, and that anecdotal evidence isn't particularly strong. So what well, I, don't think, I think what I think what the, the meta analysis is actually all of experimental work. I mean, what what's called anecdotal is what I've been calling case histories, and 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 those those those. I, I, my argument is that those case histories require a legal um, uh, framework of evidence rather than a scientific frame because they aren't repeatable experiments. And I argued that as far back as my book Survival. It's our dog downstairs. Um, as far back as my book Survival in it came out first in 1984. And in fact, I don't know anybody else who's who's considered this difference between scientific and legal evidence. But I think in the cases that we're looking at, it's extremely useful. Um, and you can't you can't accuse um, the law of not being rigorous. It's just rigorous in its own terms. <laughs> 